Anchester, and in as bad a condition as the old town on the other side of the Iwall. Farther away from the river lies the newer portion, which is, however, already beyond the limit of its forty years of cottage life, and therefore ruinous enough. All Salford is built in courts or narrow lanes, so narrow, that they remind me of the narrowest I have ever seen, the little lanes of Genoa. The average construction of Salford is in this respect much worse than that of Manchester, and so too, in respect to cleanliness. If, in Manchester, the police, from time to time, every six or ten years, makes a raid upon the working people's districts, closes the worst dwellings, and causes the filthiest spots in these Orgean stables to be cleansed, in Salford it seems to have done absolutely nothing. The narrow side lanes and courts of Chapel Street, Greengate, and Gravel Lane have certainly never been cleansed, since they were built. Of late, the Liverpool Railway has been carried through the middle of them, over a high viaduct, and has abolished many of the filthiest nooks, but what does that avail? Whoever passes over this viaduct and looks down, sees filth and wretchedness enough, and, if anyone takes the trouble, to pass through these lanes, and glance through the open oars and windows into the houses and cellars, he can convince himself afresh with every step, that the workers of Salford live in dwellings in which cleanliness and comfort are impossible. Exactly the same state of affairs is found in the more distant regions of Salford, in Islington, along Regent Road, and back of the Bolton Railway. The working men's dwellings between Oldfield Road and Cross Lane, where a mass of courts and alleys are to be found in the worst possible state, vie with the dwellings of the old town in filth and overcrowding. In this district I found a man, apparently about sixty years old, living in a cow stable. He had constructed a sort of chimney for his square pen, which had neither windows, floor, nor ceiling, had obtained a bedstead and lived there, though the rain dripped through his rotten roof. This man was too old and weak for regular work, and supported himself by removing manure with a handcart, the dung heap slain next door to his palace. Such are the various working people's quarters of Manchester as I had occasion to observe them personally during twenty months. If we briefly formulate the result of our wanderings, we must admit that 350,000 working people of Manchester and its environs live, almost all of them, in wretched damp filthy cottages, that the streets which surround them are usually in the most miserable and filthy condition, laid out without the slightest reference to ventilation. With reference solely to the profit, secured by the contractor. In a word, we must confess that in the working men's dwellings of Manchester, no cleanliness, no convenience, and consequently no comfortable family life is possible, that in such dwellings only a physically degenerate race, robbed of all humanity, degraded, reduced morally and physically to bestiality, could feel comfortable and at home. And I am not alone in making this assertion. We have seen that Dr. K gives precisely the same description, and, though it is superfluous, I quote further the words of Liberal, 63 recognized and highly valued as an authority by the manufacturers, and a fanatical opponent of all independent movements of the workers. As I passed through the dwellings of the mill hands in Irish Town, Ancoats, and Little Island, I was only amazed, that it is possible to maintain a reasonable state of health in such homes. These towns for in extent and number of inhabitants they are towns, have been erected with the utmost disregard of everything, except the immediate advantage of the speculating builder. A carpenter and builder unite, to buy a series of building sites I point E, they lease them for a number of years, and cover them with so-called houses. In one place we found a whole street following the course of a ditch, because in this way deeper cellars could be secured without the cost of digging, cellars not for storing wares or rubbish, but for dwellings for human beings. Not one house of this street escaped the cholera. In general, the streets of these suburbs are unpaved, with a dung heap or ditch in the middle, the houses are built back to back, without ventilation or drainage, and whole families are limited to a corner of a cellar or a garret. I have already referred to the unusual activity which the sanitary police manifested during the cholera visitation. When the epidemic was approaching, a universal terror seized the bourgeoisie of the city. People remembered the unwholesome dwellings of the poor, and trembled before the certainty, the teach of these slums would become a centre for the plague, whence it would spread desolation in all directions through the houses of the propertied class. A health commission was appointed at once to investigate these districts, and report upon their condition to the town council. 
Dr. K, himself a member of this commission, who visited in person every separate police district except one, the 11th, quotes six tracts from their reports there were inspected, in all, 6,951 houses, naturally in Manchester proper alone, Salford and the other suburbs being excluded. Of these, 6,565 urgently needed whitewashing within. 960 were out of repair. 939 had insufficient drains. 1,435 were damp. 452 were badly ventilated. 2,221 were without privies. Of the 687 streets inspected, 248 were unpaved, 53 but partially paved, 112 ill-ventilated, 352 containing standing pools, heaps of debris, refuse, etc. To cleanse such an orgy and stable before the arrival of the cholera was, of course, out of the question. A few of the worst nooks were therefore cleansed, and everything else left as before. In the cleansed spots, as Little Island proves, the old filthy condition was naturally restored in a couple of months. As to the internal condition of these houses, the same commission reports a state of things similar to that which we have already met with in London, Edinburgh, and other City 64. It often happens that a whole Irish family is crowded into one bed, often a heap of filthy straw, or quilts of old sacking cover all in an indiscriminate heap, where all alike are degraded by want, stolidity, and wretchedness. Often the inspectors found, in a single house, two families and two rooms. All slept in one, and used the other as a kitchen and dining room in common. Often more than one family lived in a single damp cellar, in whose pestilent atmosphere 12 to 16 persons were crowded together. To these and other sources of disease must be added, that pigs were kept, and other disgusting things of the most revolting kind were found. We must add that many families, who had but one room for themselves, receive boarders and lodgers in it, that such lodgers of both sexes by no means rarely sleep in the same bed with a married couple, and that the single case of a man and his wife and his adult sister-in-law sleeping in one bed was found, according to the report concerning the sanitary condition of the working class, six times repeated in Manchester. Common lodging houses too, are very numerous, Dr. K gives their number in 1831 at 267 in Manchester proper, and they must have increased greatly since then. Each of these receives from 20 to 30 guests, so that they shelter all told, nightly, from 5 to 7,000 human beings. The character of the houses and their guests is the same as in other cities. Five to seven beds in each room lie on the floor, without bedsteads, and on these sleep, mixed indiscriminately, as many persons as apply. What physical and moral atmosphere reigns in these holes I need not state. Each of these houses is a focus of crime, the scene of deeds against which human nature revolts, which would perhaps never have been executed, but for this forced centralization of Vice 65 Gaskell gives the number of persons living in cellars in Manchester proper as 20,000. The weekly dispatch gives the number, according to official reports, as 12% of the working class, which agrees with Gaskell's number, the workers being estimated at 175,000, 21,000 would form 12% of it. The cellar dwellings in the suburbs are at least as numerous, so that the number of persons living in cellars in Manchester, using its name in the broader sense, is not less than 40 to 50,000. So much for the dwellings of the workers in the largest cities and towns. The manner in which the need of a shelter is satisfied, furnishes a standard for the manner in which all other necessities are supplied. That in these filthy holes a ragged ill-fed population alone can dwell, is a safe conclusion, and such is the fact. The clothing of the working people, in the majority of cases, is in a very bad condition. The material used for it is not of the best adapted. Wool and linen have almost vanished from the wardrobe of both sexes, and cotton has taken their place. Shirts are made of bleached, or coloured cotton goods, the dresses of the women are chiefly of cotton print goods, and wool and petticoats are rarely to be seen on the wash line. The men wear chiefly trousers of fustian or other heavy cotton goods, and jackets or coats of the same. Fustian has become the proverbial costume of the working men who are called fusty and jackets, and call themselves so in contrast to the gentlemen who wear broadcloth, which latter words are used as characteristic for the middle class. When Theogus O'Connor, the Chartist leader, came to Manchester during the insurrection of 1842, 
he appeared, amidst the deafening applause of the working men, in a fustian suit of clothing. Hats are the universal head covering in England, even for working men, hats are the most diverse forms, round, high, broad-brimmed, narrow-brimmed, or without brims only the younger men in factory towns wearing